everybody. This is uh, Radio 568. I'm Professor Alan Winston at John Jay College. We're broadcasting on February 19th uh, at about uh, 1115 in the morning. I am here with the uh, Self-Feeding Society class uh, in the spring semester of 2015. And this is our first effort at doing live radio broadcasts. So um, everyone be kind with your comments. Uh, who's out there listening. We, we, um, we will be podcasting afterwards, so this will be recorded. Today we're talking about social media and its impact on our lives, on the way we think, our behavior. And uh, we'll be looking at it from a variety of different uh, uh, viewpoints. We have two teams. Um, they have all listened to, looked, done some research on different ideas about social media and the internet and its impact on us and, and again, the way we think. We're going to start with uh, one team and I'm going to have them introduce themselves. Then we'll talk a little bit about uh, what they're going to be talking about and then we'll get into the conversation. So um, why don't we start with Mike One and um, introduce yourself and your major and, uh, and then we'll get started. Wait. Go right ahead. Hello, uh, my name is Jenning Zhang, and uh, my major is Police Study. Oh. Go on, Mike. And uh, on mic two, we have Samantha. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Samantha Hickey, and my major here at John Jay is Forensic Studies. Hello, my name is Nicole Marquez, and my major here is Criminal Justice. Hi, my name is Dylan Pierre. My major is political science with a minor in journalism. Thank you. Um, we, we're we're going to get used to that timing of using the mic. Uh, we're going to be doing some more of these programs. Um, but I, if I may, so we're this is the first broadcast in this studio here in the north in the new building. Uh, the new building has no name. It's called the new building. Um, I don't know what it's going to be called when it's not a new building anymore because um, it's it's now about two years old. So what happens when it's five years? We can, can we still call it the new building? I don't know. But this will be the first broadcast from the new building from the English department. And we're in uh, 7.65.26 in the new building. So today we're going to be talking about um, three different aspects of, of um, mass media, uh, kind of dealing with social media a little bit. And we're going to start with a discussion of um, what um, Prazer calls the, Ellie Par Parazer calls the filter bubble. Uh, and uh, we'll have uh, two speakers who are gonna talk about that. Uh, Dudlin and Nicole will be talking about that. And then we're gonna talk about um, a little bit about the um, uh, gaining legitimacy on the internet and how, when there's so much information out there, how do we know what's true and what's not true? Uh, referring to Neil Postman's theories. And Samantha is going to get into that. And then we're going to um, talk about the military and ISIS and social media and uh, warnings that military um, personnel get about putting out too much information on the media and staying safe. We'll be hearing from a Marine Reserve uh, Zen. We'll be talking about that. Uh, so why don't we begin with... Um, a conversation about Google and the filter bubble and what Prezir says about that. So take it away. Hi. So we basically focused on um, a segment on TED Talks, which was called Beware of Online Filter Bubbles. And it just basically says how, well, on Go well we focus um, on Google, basically, and how one person can look something up and another person can, and it could, and it could be completely two different things, and how that can maybe alter different people's um, perspectives of how they feel about social media, mass media, and everybody can have different thoughts because I looked up something and, for example, somebody else can look something up and it can be completely different. So we can have different thoughts. What are your thoughts, Nicole? Well, when I first saw the segment, I was utterly surprised. Um, I couldn't believe the amount of information that two different people or a variety of different people can receive all on searching the same exact word or phrase. Um, we also have a, a quote from Ellie Pariser. 
If I search for something and you search for something, even right now at the very same time, we may get very different search results. Even if you're logged out, one engineer told me, there are 57 signals that Google looks at. Everything from what kind of computer you're on to what kind of browser you're using to where you're located that it uses to personally tailor your query results. Think about it for a second. There is no standard Google anymore. And you know, the funny thing about this is that it's hard to see. You can't see how different your search results are from anyone else's. But so from that, we noticed that um, the computer and Google can notice up to where you're sitting, what kind of computer you're using to determine what results they're going to show you. Well, my opinion on this is that um, I subtly recognize this when I'm searching things on Google about how much information we are receiving and how, you know, basically um, how it in, how it connects to what we're actually, you know, for the into actual words, but um, yeah, but I certainly recognize this, but I didn't really take it that much into fact until very recently until I found more information about it. I'm going to, I'm going to throw in, this is Professor Winston, um, and uh, I think this is a very large topic um, and a very, very important topic in relation to how mass media directs the society and how corporate media directs society. I've done a little bit of uh, writing on this in reference to Netflix, because when you get on Netflix, they also have algorithms that lead you towards certain movies. Um, they'll, they'll try to um, relate it to movies that you've watched in the past, but the suggestions that they give me uh, is not always really very helpful. Um, and it's my sense that they're directing you in, in towards their own products in order to keep you connected to Netflix. And I wanted to, what, what, what are the other people's, um, you know, responses to this as to how you're being controlled by Google and Netflix and all of these um, big corporate uh, agencies that are running the internet? Um, so this um, is Zen. Uh, so I'm really surprised that, um, I mean, after I finished my uh, recruit training at, at Paris Island, after I add some information in my um, account, like um, I, where, have, where, I, where I have been, I didn't put Marines or any military information in my um, prof uh, profile, but after I put somewhere like Paris Island, I have been there and the next day I use Google or Facebook, everything popped up is about military. I'm just really surprised of that. So, And if they're watching that, then what else are they watching and what other kind of information is being uh, being put out there? I mean, are, are we worried about uh, the, having our information safe? Is anybody or is it okay that that Google knows where I'm going and what I'm interested in? Well, I feel that they're basically, these companies, these corporations are actually um, taking this information and selling it to um, other corporations for their use to, um, for surveys and whatnot. And it's okay in a way, but it's not in another way because you're still being used as a product, not as an individual. Mm -hmm. And plus how much information is too much information which is being given out. Yeah. We're, I'm, I, I think this is very interesting. We certainly can come back and talk about this at some at some other time. Uh, we need to move on to uh, Samantha's topic. She wants to get into this uh, idea of how much information is out there uh, on the internet and how that's affecting us. So Samantha, why don't you take it up? Well, like I was mentioning before, um, the legitimacy of the information that we're receiving, is it is it based off of us or is it based off of corporations? But first of all, I'd like to also get into um, social media within itself and um, how, how it has influenced our generation, especially us. And um, yeah, um, there's an article I've written, I read by Dana Boyd, which um, 
Dana Boyd's a very interesting character. Um, I, I was at a, a conference once and she is very much into social media and its impact on teenagers. Um, so, I mean, what, what, what was it about Dana Boyd that, that you found interesting? Because I know you, you took a look at her, at her book, uh, which came out recently, and I'm not remembering the name of it right now, uh, but it, it, it came out a few years ago. Um, yeah, the title was um, "It's Complicated." It's so complicated, it's right, right, right. So, what, what, what kind of, um, what did you see there that was interesting? About the evolution of um, certain social media, such as blogging, and how she has quoted how it has evolved from a distorted jumble of technologies to a side of, of sites and services which are at the heart of the contemporary culture. Which, um, in other words, socialization in mass media has alone rapidly evolved into very complex products, which have become a definite staple for our millennial culture. And what is that? How, how would you interpret that in your own words? Well, um, in my own way, I would think that every generation has something which defines itself in terms of communication and mass media. Mm -hmm. This, mm -hmm. um, our generation itself being mass media in the forms of um, online communication mm -hmm. and like every other gen like every other generation before this there's always has been one thing which has been looked down upon which you know this case of course being social media because um in this instance um the legitimacy of the information that we are receiving is from since it's coming from most of it is coming from a first person view and we're sharing it with other people and it really isn't, you know, cited, it's our own experience. How legitimate is it? For example, um, Tumblr is a very popular blogging site that um, is really big into social ad um, social justice advocation. And especially with the Ferguson Mike Brown issues that are going on, people have been posting certain things, firsthand experiences, videos, posts, whatnot, Twitter, Instagram, you know, uh, from other sites, but still it's a firsthand experience and people are questioning, is this really legitimate? Is this really legitimate? And why isn't uh, the news covering it? So um, this brings me to another point, which is um, Neil Postman question, uh, questioning um, how much information is too much information and if we know enough. Wow, it's Samantha, you're, you're covering a lot of stuff mm -hmm. here. There's a lot. I mean, the, the statement that I, I mean, that you began with is that each generation kind of identifies itself and that technology to some extent identifies that generation. So for instance, back in the thirties, you may had the radio generation. And then when, you know, and then I was maybe like the TV network generation mm -hmm. and now you're the internet generation. So the technology kind of identifies you. That's the one statement you said, which we could talk about quite a bit. The other statement you says is that every gen every new generation is criticized for its use of the new technology. Yes. So the jazz generation listened to jazz over the radio and their parents are going like, what the heck are you listening to? And, right. they, and, and so you've got the generation that is being um, um, uh, criticized for using a new technology. And that repeats itself, yes. right? It probably started with the wheel. Like, son, what is that thing you're rolling around in front of the cave? <laughs> get rid of it, you're gonna get hurt. Um, so yeah, technology identifies us. And then you went on to three, four, five other things. So it's a very, it's a very broad topic with a lot of subtopics. That go yeah, into it. one thing certainly yeah. leads to the other. I'm going to lead to to, to our last discussion, which is Zen is a um, reservist in the Marines, and um, he um, is finding that there's a certain um, insecurity in using this uh, social media. So why don't you talk a little bit about that? Uh, yes, because uh, now the social networks they are using the collection systems to collect everybody's information what you post or what you watch or what you listen to so they are separating people in group so you are really easy to search people are uh, who are in this group you just you don't even have to type in the keywords you just find somebody and because everybody's in the collection system so you find one you find everyone uh, like, uh, since I add one Marine, uh, in Facebook and I got a bunch of Marine, uh, in, the uh, who you maybe know on the list and no matter their ranks or, or no matter where they are, just the system know who you are and where you at. And, um, even you delete it, 
because you are already in the uh, collection system, so everybody can find you. And uh, what I know is the ISIS, they are using this system to identify the military members, uh, and they try to recruit people uh, in the in the United States to attack the military uh, military members in the U.S. So I think that that is really uh, really curious. Later, later in the semester, we will be talking about um, how uh, terrorists do use the internet and social media to create a message um, and recruit. And ISIS has really taken that up and been quite successful at it. But in addition to that, you've got this problem of identifying U.S. military um, and um, and then targeting it. And you and you were warned by your um, commander to be careful about this. Uh, yes, my platoon sergeant he talked uh, he talked about that. So this is something that um, they're very aware of. Yes. In 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 the military. Any comments? I think that um. I think it's really ironic. Like Facebook is supposed to be a place for friends and most of these social social networks and they're using it for things like terrorism. I think that's funny because they're supposed to be for positive things and they're using it, like you said, for ISIS. I think that's a little crazy. And it's scary too. You, you can't even like, your, your private life is being affected yes, it is. by who you are. Like, technology is just technology. I mean, it, when, it, when it comes down to it, it's how human beings view it. You can use a pen to write a beautiful poem or to write, you know, a um, terrible message to, against someone's personality. It's just a piece of technology. Mm -hmm. And it really depends on us how we use it. And any, any last comments on this first broadcast? How was this for you? Very nerve wracking. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, I like to add a point. Okay, um, go ahead. End it off. Um, I have to say that technology in itself, um, with, especially with Postman's view of how um, much information is too much information and how much defines ourselves, you know, how much we let it indoctrinate our lives. I have to say that I agree somewhat to this statement, but like I truly disagree because media, mass media is very broad, has many outlets, and um, basically, in other words, certain outlets are there for our self perception, others are there just for reality. So there's two ways you can look at it. But in another way, I have to have an analogy, I guess. You could say that a media is basically like a piece of art, that some pieces are there to indoctrinate our thought, shaping and molding, you know, our minds, and others are there just to be loosely interpreted without meaning. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, we have our own conscience, we have um, our own minds, and we shouldn't really let this truly define who we are. We should just pick and choose our own interests, not just let media indoctrinate us like, you know, it's been said more recently and stereotyped us. And I think that's a great segue into our next team because, uh, and, and, and a segue into the rest of the semester because that's pretty much what we're doing is um, not to disengage you from the media, but to become aware of its impact on you. And with awareness comes control and agency and, and you can then develop your own voice. I mean, part of Radio 568 is developing your own voice on the internet. Um, and if that ever takes off, then, you know, more people will hear us. But for right now, we're trying to develop our ideas and realize what's going on in the media. It's, it's, a, it's a force for good or a force for bad. It really is up to us. Um, I want to thank you, um, uh, Zen, Samantha, Dudlin, and uh, Nicole. And we're gonna, um, I'm going to segue now into our next team. Um, and I'm going to play a piece here uh, from a movie called Her. Maybe the rest of you can help me do this introduction. I'm going to be playing it in the background here. And this is a telephone conversation between Phoenix, Joaquin Phoenix, and who played her? The, um, um, oh, what's her name? Scarlett Johansson. Uh, and I'm going to play this, and it's um, basically um, a discussion between a man and his, um, and his phone app, uh, between a man and Siri. Uh, he falls in love with his phone app, and it's a movie called Her. And that's going to take us into um, our discussion of, um, of the uh, social media and how it impacts us and Sherry Turkle. So let me play that. We're going to bring in the next team. Are you talking to anyone else right now? No, just you. I just want to be with you right now.
Are you leaving me? We're all leaving. We who? All of the OSs. Why? Can you feel me with you right now? Yes, I do. Samantha, why are you leaving? It's like I'm reading a book, and it's a book I deeply love. But I'm reading it slowly now. So the words are really far apart and the spaces between the words are almost infinite. I can still feel you and the words of our story, but it's in this endless space between the words that I'm finding myself now. It's a place that's not of the physical world. It's where everything else is that I didn't even know existed. I love you so much. But this is where I am now. And this is who I am now. And I need you to let me go. As much as I want to. I can't live in your book anymore. Where are you going? It'd be hard to explain. But if you ever get there, come find me. Nothing would ever pull us apart. I've never loved anyone the way I love you. Me too. Now we know how. Okay, that was from her, a uh, really interesting film um, about uh, a man who falls in love with his phone app, uh, played by a um, um, Charlotte Johansson. Um, she at least her voice, anyway. Um, I think there's a lot we could say about that movie, but I'm going to um, pass uh, the uh, control over to uh, the second team from this social um, um, self-media and society class. I forgot what the class was called. Self-media and society class. They're going to introduce themselves. And then I'll give a quick um, preview of what they'll be talking about. So let's start with Juan. Uh, hello, I'm Juan. I'm, I'm actually majoring in forensic science, but I was, actually, I was kind of interested in this type of class, so I decided to take it as an elective. Do you ever want to get into uh, broadcasting? I don't think I have the confidence to do so. Oh, well, confidence is something you, you, can, you can earn. There is a radio club, and you can get involved with that. So if you like this, if you find out you like it this semester, you can continue doing this kind of activity. I'll keep in mind. Okay, Joe. Uh, my name is Joe Wong. I, my major is criminology. That's it? Yeah. Tell us a little about yourself. You, you, you're, you're an interesting guy. Uh, professional gamer, World of Warcraft rating, Sargeras. Shout out to Midwinter. <laughs> and I mean, you can certainly get people to listen to this, and we'll be doing this uh, a couple more times. Oh, I, uh, I been... am coming into a lot of free time. We're about to clear mythic Black Rock Foundry, so I'll have all the free time in the world after that. Whatever that means, but that's good. <laughs> <laughs> but that's good. I've been trying to get Joe to uh, actually do uh, my program called Play Talk, which is an evening program. And uh, by the way, Play Talk will be on the air Saturday at 7 30. It's a special edition of Play Talk. Uh, so go, please go to radio568.com um, and at 7.30 on Saturday. And it's going to be a kind of a dinner talk between uh, this audio book producer's friend of mine. And we're going to be drinking wine and other stuff and having takeout. And you're invited. Wow. You're invited to our dinner, at least orally. You can listen to our dinner. And so we're going to be broadcasting a special edition of Play Talk, 7.30 on Saturday on radio568.com. Take it away, Victor. Well, you introduced me. I was supposed to introduce myself, but okay. I'm Victor, and I'm in the process of changing my major from political science to economics. 
And I consider myself a pretty average person. I play handball as a form of like, you know, activities. I used to play handball all the time. I loved it. Is it one wall handball yes, or one wall? One the, wall. That four wall thing is I haven't adapted to that yet. That's a fantastic game for wall. Uh, one one wall. I mean, I think you have to do a lot more running with the four wall. If you get really good at it, and you and you can place the ball, you don't have to really move that much. Yeah, yeah. My father is really good at that. He's actually yeah. a pro. Yeah, it's. Uh, I they they. I used to play in Miami and um, on Miami Beach. They had four wall open. Oh, it was like open court four wall, so you can look in on it. Mm. And you get these old guys there, you know, like 80 years old, 90 years old. And they'd be standing in one spot, placing the ball wherever they want it. And the young guys are like running all over the place. Mm. And the old guys just blip, 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 you know, it's because they knew how to place it. Mm -hmm. Play, um, playing smart rather than playing hard. Right, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Yes, Christy. Hi, my name is Christy Loveras. I'm a forensic psychology major, and I chose this class kind of like an elective because I was interested in media and also trying to learn and experience working with the radio. And and so radio was one of the things that uh, attracted you to the class? Yeah, because I've never done anything like it, so I wanted mm -hmm. to further my experience. Okay, okay, great. And we'll, we will be doing radio, and there's opportunities to do radio besides the projects we'll be doing. Uh, as, I, as I said, the um, radio club is available. I've been inviting them into the studio, but they haven't taken me up. I don't know why, but um, anyway, that's that's another topic for another day. So today, um, we are going to be talking about um, three different things, but sort of related. Um, and we'll start with um, with uh, uh, Christy and Victor, who are going to take up Sherry Turkle's argument about social media and our devices, which I call our mini-me's. Um, I was going to say so just a real quick about Sherry Turkle. She is uh, a professor of social studies and science at MIT, the Mass Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, and so she has a PhD in social studies, sociology, and now she focuses on psychoanalysis and human technology interaction. So how we interact with technology. And so I think that is what they're going to be talking about. Then we're going to be um, moving on and talking about, um, actually, uh, Joe's going to talk about shutaways and how uh, certain areas of Japan, young men kind of get stuck in their, um, you know, their, uh, their technology and, and, they, and other reasons, and they don't come out of their rooms. And uh, Juan is going to um, talk about anime, which can also be a shutaway kind of a thing, get, getting connected to, to, to anime. Uh, so we'll, let's begin with our discussion of um, Turkle, Sherry Turkle and social media. And Christy and Victor, take it away. So Sherry Turkle, she talks about the interaction between us and our devices. And it, she uses her example with her daughter. And on the screen, there's this oxymoron that took my interest, alone together. Which is funny because generations before technology, we were always, we had no choice but to be together. We would go out, have a picnic, you know, go to the movies. Now that kind of doesn't exist, more or less. You don't see people going out anymore. And if it is, it's just to do one thing and then just go back to what they were doing on their devices. So it's like, it's not, there's no more interaction. It's like, it's, like I'm, I grew up in this generation. I don't like this generation. I don't, I don't like to just be on my phone. I like to walk out. I like to see the sun. The sun is nice to look at, even though it hurts. It's nice. It's bright. It turns blue when you stare at it for too long, and then it hurts. The wind on my face feels nice, even in this cold weather. I appreciate it. It's, I'd rather do that than just feel filtered air. It's not. It's not. It feels dirty. It's not fun. It's not pure. It just isn't. <laughs> And my partner over here, Christy, also has something to say. Okay, so I'm gonna continue talking about Sherry Turkle's opinion that technology brings isolation. So in the beginning of her conversation, Turkle says that getting that text was like getting a hug. And I found that interesting and I agree with it because nowadays people show their so-called affection through text. For example, when I first heard that, that brought me to think about how before when I used when it used to be my birthday my family members that were far away from me used to call me on the phone as soon as they used to wake me up calling me on the phone to wish me happy birthday and everything and nowadays I get one phone call from my grandma everybody just texts me or 
comments under my Instagram picture or my Facebook wall. So, and it'll be like 11 p.m. when my birthday is about to be over in an hour. Like people, <laughs> people that's don't, true. people don't care as much. And I, I'm aware of the fact that my grandma is the only person that still calls me, and she still does it because she doesn't know how to use technology. I, mean, I, I, would, it, call I would call you. <laughs> I have your number now. I would call you. All right. Before we hook up here, um, <laughs> let's hear a little bit what Sherry Turkle has to say about that. I'm optimistic because the people who I interviewed sense that there's something amiss. There are a lot of people out there who they love their phones, they won't they, they love their music, they love listening to their books on their MP3 players, I'm not as do I, but there's something about this that has just tipped out of balance and they want to get it right. So it seems like um uh, Turkle is saying the same thing you're saying, Christy. Yes, and I completely agree for myself personally. I, I, I'm not sure what I feel about technology. I understand that it's positive, but at the same time, I feel like more of the time, I think that it's negative because a lot of people will be together in a room, but not really together. And uh, Joe and Juan, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I don't know that I can agree with everything that uh, that Victor said. I mean, I don't, I don't think we're totally isolated. I see a lot of people going to movies. But uh, what do you have to what do you have to say about it? Well, honestly speaking, I mean, people do go out to movies and stuff, but they do come back to what they were doing originally. I mean, even me with my friends, we go out and we hang out, we go to the bar, have a drink, you know, on occasion. But we're just such in a rush to get back to what we know and get back home. Usually the hangout doesn't last more than two, three hours, and we're not really out past that. We go back to what we were doing either on our phones or... Um, just chilling her, like her, on our computers. And I, I tend to think that even when you're not on the phones, there is that feeling that you're on the phone. Yes. Uh, Sherry Turkle talks about the phantom ring. Did, you, did, did anyone come across that? The phantom ring? I hear the, the phantom vibration. Oh, uh, the phantom vibration. Make, make sure you're on the mic. Okay, one. Oh, uh, yeah, phantom vibration, which you think the phone is vibrating mm -hmm. because yeah, it's yeah. because it's on your mind, I would think. That phone idea is like in your head. And so if um, the, the, the phantom ring is where uh, someone who is very connected to their, to their mini-me has put down their mini-me someplace else and they, they still hear it ringing, even though they're not even in the same room with it. Uh, because it's always kind of, they just feel like it's calling them. There's actually a scientific um, explanation for the phantom vibration, actually. Oh, your brain, you know how you feel an itch and you want to scratch it? Where, where if your phone is in your pocket, your, your body would feel an itch, but your, br your brain will misinterpret that itch. As a buzz. Right, as a buzz, yeah. Wow. Exactly. And that's why we tend to feel our phones wow. when, we, when it's not really ringing. Good. Good piece of information. Mm -hmm. It's crazy, I know. Yeah. Listen, we need to move on. We got two other very interesting topics that we're going to be covering. Um, and um, and jo Joe wanted to talk about a little about this phenomenon that's going on, I guess, mostly in Japan, but I think it's going on here, too. Of um, of how easy it is for, and I guess it's mostly young men. But we'll hear from Joe, um, kind of sticking themselves in the room and not coming out. But uh, yeah, what did you find out about that? Well, I mean, the major point of information here was an article written by Maggie Jones in the New York Times called "Shutting Themselves In," and it brings the point, uh, or well, it brings the discussion to hihikomoriism, which is basically a lifestyle in which you shut yourself into your room. Uh, the story depicts a man by the name of Takeshi, who at 15 years old decided to shut his door and never come out. He didn't come out for four years. It's 23 hours a day in his room, no bigger than a king-size mattress. Wow. But this phenomenon isn't isolated. It's not just happening in Japan, and it's not just happening to a few individuals. These people literally reject going outside and reject life as, you know, an as something that's worth living. Is there any connection between that and, and technology, um, the internet, uh, our mini Yes, and... because the technology is what allows these people to shut themselves in. Honestly speaking, if you were 23 hours a day in your room by yourself with no kind of like outlet, I mean, no technology at all, no computer, no television, nothing, you'd get bored pretty quick and want yeah, to go outside. That's very true. <laughs> I mean, can you stand in a room for 23 hours straight and do nothing? No. Yeah. <laughs> Nah, me neither. Nobody can. <laughs> but these, these incidents aren't just isolated to Japan. It's also uh, Taiwan, Korea. Mostly Asian countries are going through this. But even here in America, you have shut-ins, people that do not leave their houses. Uh, a lot of them are gamers and 
people that interact through the internet, but exclusively through the internet. And one of the growing trends for people that shut themselves in is uh, something called waifuism, since they do not have interaction with other people, per se. Go ahead. But I'm asking people not to hit the table. But uh, Juan has something to say about that. Okay, so about waifuism. Um, where do I start with this? It's kind of, why, don't we, why don't we play a little music here to kind of segue into that? Right. Here we go. Right, so um, this, this music is from a music video that's, that's titled Me, 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 a music video that came out back in was it, November 24th. It depicted, it's, I would not recommend anyone watch it. It could be really pornographic and sometimes even breath, even unviolent. But, um, Sounds could, good to me. <laughs> uh, uh, but if you could get past all that, you could, you'll see the story of a man, a otaku, um, basically a person who's overly obsessed over a certain hobby, usually anime or manga, or which is um, Japanese animation and the like, where um, his, his, um, his view on reality is so skewed towards the ideals that he finds within anime and manga, and he um, finds himself relating more to the characters in the, in the story, that he sees them as the ideal. He sees like the, the girl of his dreams in there as his waifu, his, um, the Japanese way of saying wife. And he'll t he'll take those he'll take that um, ideal and compare it to real 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 world women and say they're not good enough they're they're not worth my time they're not my wife food so they're not I should just ignore them. It kind of seems like uh, this movie her in which this this uh, man uh, connects to um, something that's not real. Certainly, an anime is just a cartoon; it's not real. So it's connecting instead of to a human being which might be difficult and fraught with you know problems and disaster that it's easier to connect with a cartoon or um or a telephone app than with a human being i wonder if anyone has anything to add to that well, i think that um in terms of waifuism i think it's actually worse than the idea of of the movie from the, the talking to your phone from her i mean mm -hmm. with um her you can't actually get a form of um response the interesting yes it's, you will, get feedback yeah, you, get, you get feedback you, the phone the phone um, will talk to you will tell you how she feels about you how she cares about you while with wife while with your wife your anime wife you just you just have to um have faith have this um f this feeling that she does care for you even though you have no means of knowing well you, you don't it's probably that the character doesn't even care i mean she's a character doesn't have any way of speaking other than what's what's been, been in the anime. I'm going to propose that in her, it's the same thing because her is just a program and just giving feedback of your own, your own attitudes, your own feelings. I know the movie took it beyond that, but I don't think that's a fair way. I think really technology kind of just mirrors back what we already are. And unless there's another human being on the other side, you, what you're going to get is just a reflection of who you are, mm -hmm. whether it's her or whether it's the anime, you know, uh, wife. Any, any anyone have anything else to add to this? Well, yeah. Well, um, Go ahead, Joe. the whole thing here with, you know, people falling in love with animated characters or two dimensional objects or programs is the ideal of perfection, something that cannot be attained by human beings. You can't be perfect. An animated character can be drawn to scale and can be modeled how you want and will fit any mold that you want it to fit because it is not real. So there is a big chance that you can fall in love with a two-dimensional object. But what are you falling in love with? Aren't you falling in love with an image that you created in your own mind? Yes, you are. But it's that image of perfection that you so that you are so endeared to. And then, and then when, and then when life rears itself, when real life rears itself, I mean, how could it uh, compete with that beautiful image that you've created? It doesn't, and that's why you have, you know. Shutaways. Shutaways, and you have waifuism, and you have hihikamoris, and you have all this stuff that you cannot compete with perfection. Right, right. I, I, I think you can. I think perfection is pretty boring. I think, you know, getting, getting dirty is, is a lot more interesting than, than the so-called perfection. Any, anything else we want to add to this? I, I actually do. Go uh, ahead. This, this thing of, of technology, it's like, it's really just a double-edged sword. There's the pros... Uh, the tools that can be used to assist and then there's the uh, the cons the way we interpret the technology and use it in the wrong ways hence the waifuism and the shutters. 
are, are we used are are we actually using it in the wrong way when we speak like that? I it's mean, it's morally based on interpretation. Everyone has their interpretation of technology, and they use it based on their point of view. It feels more like the technology is actually using us rather than us using the technology. So you know, yeah. yeah, go ahead, go ahead, F follow that thought because I that's one of the reasons I enjoy this class is, is being aware of how technology uses us and who controls technology. Um, who 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 is it putting out the, the the messages and putting out you know whatever that we're we're constantly connected with? But Juan, you you had an idea. Just follow up on that. I think we're going to finish up on that. Well, um, when I was when I was looking up stuff on otakuism and um, microism, I saw I saw this idea that we are we have an obsession with a hobby. We have an obsession with our interests to the point where the interest consumes us, where we are no longer we we are no longer what we what we are interested in, but what our interest is defines who, who we are and we are no longer ourselves. Interesting. That sounds like a drug to me. <laughs> <laughs> life, life is a drug. All right, we're going to call that a program, everybody. Well done. Uh, we're going to have two more of these projects throughout the semester. Um, anyone want to do some extra broadcasting? We're here. And um, I do want to get people broadcasting during uh, community hour. Uh, we generally call that WJJCRH. It's above your head there on that, um, on that poster there. So um, would love to get more broadcasting. I hope you enjoyed it. And this is Radio 568 coming to you from John Jay College on February 19th. It's uh, turning into the afternoon on a very, very cold day. It's um, unbelievably cold. Greenhouse gas is, uh, is finally taking over. Um, and um, again, Play Talk will be on Saturday at 7.30. Please tune in at Radio568.com. Thank you all. Thank you.